Okay, so let's ask God's blessing on our time this morning. Our Father, we just thank you again for the privilege to gather together around your inerrant word and, uh, and to uh, look into it and see what message you might have for each of us today. We thank you for preserving your word down through the ages for us. We thank you, Lord, that we're able to sit here and uh, do this uh, without fear of persecution. We know that there are places in the world where they would uh, be put in prison or actually uh, even uh, put to death for doing what we're doing here this morning, looking into your word. We thank you, Leona's here this morning. We thank you, Lord, for her, and we pray that we might be a blessing to her. And Father, we just uh, ask now that you prepare each of our hearts to be fed richly from your word this morning. Uh, and Father, we just uh, pray for those and our, and our families and and uh, our neighbors that need Christ as their Savior, uh, trusting in his finished work on the cross of Calvary, nothing added, nothing taken away. He died, for, paid the full price of our sin debt, bearing our sins in his body, shed his precious blood to pay the full atoning price, was buried, uh, ra rose the third day, and sits at your right hand, even now making intercession for us. And Lord, we pray and look for a soon return. We live in a very evil world today, Father. And Father, we just uh, ask now uh, that this, uh, thank you for this time of fellowship that we have together each Wednesday, uh, asking it all in Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, so last, uh, we are in the book of 1 Timothy. As Paul uh, writing to Timothy, he's sending him, uh, he's sending Timothy to the church at Ephesus and uh, to make sure that everything is being, as we would say, de done decently and in order. And in, in the early days of the church, there was always the, the issue of, of false teaching entering into. There's always, there's, always, there's always some kind of antagonism against God's in inerrant word. Wherever the truth is spoken, you're going to find people and things going on that are trying to undermine it, to lead people away from it. We know that uh, the Lord, before his return, said that, uh, asked the question, will faith be found when I come, come back? And the answer is probably very little. We see our, our fundamental, our Bible preaching and teaching churches are being emptied out. And they're being replaced by churches with a concert kind of mentality. Somebody just said of all that's, a, that's a bogey. Yeah. That yeah, is a bogey. That's yeah, definitely a. Yeah. <laughs> I'll edit all this out. <laughs> but anyway, we know that uh, there were things going on in the early church. We know that things are going on today. We know that our world is turning upside down. They're calling things that are good evil. The things that are evil, they're good. We see it before our very eyes. Our country today is not what it was back in the 1950s and early 60s and, and before. It's a different country, different values. And man, many, if not most of those new values are in, in opposition to what God's word says. But it's not new. It was going on from the very early days of the church, back, uh, all the way back in the, when the, the apostles were still on, on, the, on the earth. And so he's sending Timothy to, uh, to straighten things out. So Timothy has got a, a, a sizable job. He's, uh, I don't know, like to use the word job in the ministry. He's got a, a sizable calling to go back and, and deal with these issues. In, on page 77, in, where we ended up, I believe, last week. Uh, some, on page 75? Oh, okay. Yeah, we've got to be specific here. I'm an old man. <laughs> okay, so he's talking. He's he, not only is Paul send uh, Paul sending uh, Timothy to Ephesus, he's kind of preparing him for the kinds of things he's going to uh, engage in, uh, engage in. And uh, Daisy, if you don't sit down, you're going to the pound. Oh. Yeah, I'm talking to you, girl. See, I don't care about what you. She was so good last week. She's getting even this today. Yeah. So in verse 5 here, it talks, uh, Paul is writing this letter to Timothy, not only to, uh, to encourage him, but we mentioned earlier, this would give 
Timothy a letter of authority for doing the things that he's going to be doing. Verse 5, he says, Perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. And so in the first uh, four verses of, of, uh, of chapter 6 is where we are. Uh, and starting in verse 3, he talks about uh, those that are, are not consenting, he says, not consenting to wholesome words. They're changing the word of God to fit their idea. They're, they're reading things into God, God's word rather than reading them out of God's word. If any man teach otherwise, verse 3, and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Those are wholesome words. When Christ speaks, when God speaks, those are wholesome words. And, uh, and to the doctrines, which is according to godliness. God teaches us in, in his word to, to live a life that will be pleasing to him and honoring to him. And so he's telling Timothy that when you get to Ephesus, there's going to be opposition to that. In verse uh, 4, he says, he is proud. This is the people that are, the false teachers that are, that are being, are going to be found there at Ephesus. And they're found everywhere today. He says, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereby, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings. So these are the, the, the people that come in and start uh, they come into a church that has been given the word, given the truth, and then you start pick out a word and start talking about creating doubt. That's that's the way Satan works in the world. He creates doubt. In the Garden of Eden, he created doubt in Eve's mind. God told Eve and Adam that if you eat of this tree, of the knowledge of good and evil, you can eat of every other tree. Well, we don't know what that tree is. You can eat of anything else. But don't eat that. This was a test of obedience. And what does Satan do? He comes in and he talks to Eve and he says, well, you know, will God really kill you? You know, he, you know he's creating that doubt. And, of course, that's all that was needed there. And we're often uh, now living in, in, as a result of all the sin that happened after that. He talks about his proud knowing nothing. The word proud here has the sense of one who clouds the truth with smoke. We talk. We use the phrase "smoke and mirrors." When somebody is is telling us something, and somebody is, you're creating doubt, because you don't know if it's real or not, and so uh, creating of doubt, and then actual uh, blasphemy against God, evil surmisings, hurtful suspicions, and again, falsely raising doubt with respect to character. I was thinking about it today. What is our world doing? What is one of the main uh, oppositions to f fundamental teaching, the teaching of God's word? Is, is Christ actually God manifest in the flesh? Or is he just a very good man and a great prophet who did great things? Well, if you read the Bible uh, and you look, when asked if he was the son of, uh, of God, he, he, he answered, he said, yes, I am. So he can't, if he's not the son of God, if he's not God manifest in the flesh, he's a liar. And therefore he can't be a good man. But these are, they create, they create these controversies. And the one today is there's the attack on the deity of Christ. They want to reduce Christ to man. And the same thing, and what else is going on at the same time? They're trying to reduce man, and I mean men and women, to be animals. So once you, get, once you get the world to believe that Christ is just a, a good man, and then, you want, then once you, again, you get the world to believe that man is just another animal, then the characteristics and the, and the, and the, and the most, man gets treated as an animal rather than, as the, as the Bible tells us, the one creation that God created in his own image. We are different. We are not animals. We are not... We are not that's an animal there. The little white dog there being a pest is an animal. We are not animals. And if we're, if we're, if we're saved, we have the Spirit of God indwelling in us. So th there's so much going on in our world today. It's just, it, it gets all clouded by other kinds of issues, but there's this undercurrent of what's trying to go on. There is more advertisement on TV today about saving dogs and, and dolphins and whales 
Then there is about saving children. These are the perverse disputings of men of corrupt mind in verse 5, and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. From such withdraw thyself. He's telling Timothy, don't even engage these people. Don't even engage in, in a discussion with them. Perverse disputings, creating controversy, and almost always doubt. They're men of correct minds. They're perverted. You know, the, the, the idea there, the word, the Greek word is perverted, to rot thoroughly, d decay utterly. It's a very strong word. Destitute of the truth. They're deprived. They're kept back by, they're, they're, they're deceived people. They, they're deceived and they, and they preach deception. Supposing that gain is godliness. This, this was the Jewish notion. We know that God was dealing with the nation of, of, of Israel. Uh, the, the idea was if, if we have material gain, then God is having favor with us. Well, we know in our culture today, a lot of people that have a lot of material things are evil people and, and not. But the Jews in the early days believed that if you, were, if you were poor, that God was not showing his favor to you. And that you had, and then if you had much, that God was. And they had that idea that they associated with material gain, with God's, with God's blessing. Some of the most godly people in the world are stone poor. And some of the richest people in the world are, are really evil. How about this guy Soros? He's always feeding money into these evil, evil organizations. And there's a lot of others. His just came to mind. Supposing that gain is godliness. Uh, you, you read the scripture. The Christian life is not an easy life. It may be, God may give, may, may give wealth to, to certain people. Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus, when he got saved, yeah, you know, he had a lot of money, he says, and I, and I give some of it away, and I, and I, you know, and they dispense it and help other people. Uh, and so, this was a Jewish notion that material wealth reflected God's favor upon a person, and that the lack of it was his disfavor. That's how they dealt with these things. That's why they, in some ways, treated the poor so poorly. They figured, well, God's treating you poorly. Yeah, I'm going to treat you poorly, too. From such withdraw. Timothy, don't get involved with these discussions. Top of page 78. In Romans chapter 16, verse 17, Now I beseech you, brethren, speaking of born-again believers, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. In every church, of any size, there are always people that will come that, are, that will want to divide, divide the congregation. They'll, want, they'll, they'll create a little clique, and they'll pick out something, and they'll, they'll, they'll cause division. That's how, that's how churches collapse, is by division. And there's always a risk. When you change, if you have a great pastor and a good pastor who's faithful to the word, that's tremendous. But when he goes away, <laughs> and, and, and we need to be so careful when we choose new people coming in, we need to do due diligence because they'll come in and they'll, they'll bring in some heresy or some false teaching, and then you get a, you get a church divi divided and things, things happen quickly. Some things can happen very quickly. In 2 Thessalonians verse three, chapter 3, verse 6, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the traditions which he received of us. There are people out there that claim to, that claim to know Christ as their Lord and Savior. They wear the T-shirts with Jesus written on them. They have the bumper stickers on the car and the little danglies on the, the here and the other. And they're, they're, they can be rowdy and vulgar and, and, uh, and, and all kinds of issues. They bring reproach on the name of Christ. And uh, we're told to withdraw from themselves. They're walking disorderly. They may show up on church on Sunday. Sometimes may, may draw, show up in church with the smell of liquor on their breath. Or, or maybe their eyes pupils twice the size they should be because they, they're doped up. Paul tells them, stay away from them. 2 Timothy 3, 5, having, there are some that have a form of godliness but, desi but denying the power thereof, 
from such turn away. There are some people that can, that can tell you all that's in this book and tell you all about it, but they, they don't live it. it this, is supposed to, this is supposed to be the guide for our, our daily lives, not just Sunday or Wednesday night or whenever. Verse 6, but godliness with contentment is great gain. And that word contentment is so uh, such an important word. But, but in contrast, you know, but in contrast to involvement in, in the foregoing, Paul says they have, they have it backwards. They have it backwards. Having material possessions is not necessarily something that's going to bring you contentment. We have too much junk. I've got a shed full of junk. I've got a trailer with junk. I, I can't, I don't know where to put the junk. Gain is not godliness, but rather godliness is great gain, spiritual gain. With contentment, with regard to material things, we should be content with that which is necessary. In Matthew chapter, uh, verse, chapter 6, verse 25, this is the Lord speaking. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life. He's speaking to the disciples and, and those around him, not just the twelve, but the others. Take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat or food, and the body more than clothes or raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. So, you know, we go out and see the birds every day. They're feeding. They don't, they don't have to go to a bird store or anything, or they don't have to work or do, you know, you know, God provides for them. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, neither do gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit to his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which is, which is today and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith. Therefore take no thought, saying, What ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, or whether all ye shall be clothed. For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for, tomorrow, for the morrow shall be, take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. So all that I put in there because the, that the Lord was preaching. Where did the Lord, where did the Lord in his, 33-year earthly ministry live. Well, we know he lived with his, with Mary and Joseph for a while while he was well, young. But there's that 18-year period between his 12-year, being 12 years old in the temple and his uh, earthly ministry at, at age 30. We have, there's, there's, not, there's not a word written in here that I can find about those years. But we know that when he did begin his earthly ministry it was around 30 years of age and John the Baptist was now on the scene and said behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world and he was pointing at the Lord Jesus Christ so when in those 30, when he was where did he live? he didn't have a house he, he told them he didn't even have a place to lay down and go to sleep and yet he's the creator and, uh, and sustainer of the entire universe so, but he humbled himself now, and he, he compares Solomon to Solomon, you know, all the money and all the, you know, as the king who started well and end, ended terribly. But he says, he says, you need, we need to be content with the, just food, clothing, and shelter. Now, are, are we in this room content with that? We sure not. We're, we're not content with that. But there are people living in the world that basically that's all they have. And we're to be, both be content with that. So our material needs are really minimal. Our needs are minimal. But we would be, what, but would we be content with them? And the answer is no. I mean, we, <laughs> we are not content. 
Psalm 37, verse 16. A little that a righteous man hath is better than the riches of many wicked. Hebrews 13, 5. Let your conversation or your lifestyle be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. Now, I'm close to that. I'm close to going to glory, too. If I was in my 50s or 40s, then I'd be a liar if I was saying that. But uh, be, your conversation be without covetous, covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he had said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Proverbs 16, 8. Better is a little with righteousness than great revenues without right. Now we have... Now we have not righteousness of our own. So where do we where do we get our righteousness? Paul's own testimony is is this. The in Philippians chapter 4 Paul is talking about himself. Not that I speak of respect of want for I have learned that in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Now this is after his conversion to Christianity. As a Jew, he was an up and coming Pharisee probably having great authority and probably having a fair amount of wealth. And now he says, I'm content. He says, I'm con whatever state I'm in, I'm content. We know he was beaten many times. We know he was stoned. We know he was shipwrecked. He was put in prison often. And he's saying I, he was always content wherever he was because he knew where he was going. He knew this was only for a period, of a season. He knew what was ahead. He says, I know, I, in verse 12, this is uh, of that, of uh, Philippians 4, I know how to be abased, nothing, and I know how to abound, have much. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer. I can do all things through Christ which strengthened me. People need to prepare their hearts to be content in whatever circumstances God places them. Contentment is, is so important. It doesn't mean that things are going well. But you know that if God, if, you know if God puts you in that place, that he has a purpose for it. He's trying to, he's trying to develop something in, your, in, your, in, your, in our lives. When we put our contentment in material things, uh, they last for just a little while. You go on a cruise and you have a good, you have a good four or five days, and then a month later, uh, you say, you know, how was that cruise? Oh, yeah. It, it, it's gone. All the contentment is gone. It, it, now we're looking for the next one. Or we have a car. And we buy a car. And then we look and we say, oh, I want, and we buy a next one and a next one and a next one. And so we're, we're never content. We're always buying things or going places. It's interesting. It's, it's, we call it amusements. And I heard this. When, you, when a word has A in front of it, like atheist, if you're a theist, you're, you're a believer in God. If you're an atheist, atheist, you're a non-believer. The word muse, M-U-S-E, in amusement, means to to think and 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 to think about. <laughs> so when we go to the the park or someplace, the amusement park, we go to a place where we really don't ever use our mind. It's a, a muse. It's a mi it's a mindless thing. We go to, for the rides and the and the and, and the, the, the shows and all that kind of thing. I thought it was kind of interesting. We, if we knew the the meaning of the word, we might probably change it. And so, Christian people need to be prepared their hearts to be content in whatever circumstances God places them. And at our age, health is always an issue. I mean, there isn't anybody in this room probably that doesn't have health issues. God tells us to be content with them. We don't have to like them. Remember Job, the book of Job is a great book. When you first read it, you say, what is all of this? But if you continue to read, you understand that Job, Job was a rich person and he was a godly man. So it's, uh, money doesn't, and wealth doesn't make you evil. If, if, if there are many good Christian folks that have large, large amounts of money. There are others that claim to be Christian that do it and are not doing it. Job had everything. He had children. He had wealth. He had all kinds of animals, servants. He had all of that. And God allowed Satan to take all that away. 
And not only that, it, took, it also allowed to take away Job's health, everything he had except his life. And this is what Job had to say as he sat there in, 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 with all kinds of disease in him, and, and the only person in his life that was left was his wife. Job thirteen fifteen, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him, but I will maintain my own ways before him. God says, even if God kills me, I'm going to trust him. For, for he's, you know, he's, got a, he's got a purpose for this, and I believe it, and I'm going to trust him. What an incredible testimony. And then we know that God restored him later on after teaching him some things. But that's the kind of faith that Job had, Job, Job had in God. You know, can we say that? Though he, though he slay me, yet will I trust him? Verse 7, For we brought nothing into this world, then it is certain we can carry nothing out. Paul reminding Timothy of these things. We, we weren't born with a silver spoon in our mouths, as they talk about. We were born just all the same. We come out of the womb, and we're crying, and we're... And we, our little sin nature is already there and starting to work. And we're crying because we're hungry. We're crying because we're wet. We're crying because we want attention. Where did they learn that? You learn, you learn the hunger and, and the wetness, but where do you learn the attention? All of us that have had children know that sometimes they cry for just attention. How do I know that? Because when you pick them up, that little switch, that's the attention switch, goes off, and they stop crying. And so it's it's just it's just interesting how children are like that. They come from the womb speaking lies. The, we're told, Job's faith was tested by Satan as as allowed by God. He had his wealth and his family taken from him, leaving him and his wife with nothing of this world's goods or family. In Job chapter 1, verse 20, Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell upon the ground and worshipped God. I mean, after all that was done to him, he bent down and he worshipped God. He praised him. He didn't understand what was going on. He really didn't understand what was going on. He says, and, and he said this, He fell down on the ground and worshipped, and he said, Naked I came out of my mother's womb, and naked I shall return thither. The Lord gave, the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all of this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. Job had, had no clue as to what was going on and why all this evil had come upon him. But he was trusting God. He was not going to blame God for anything. He knew God had a purpose. He didn't know what it was. But he knew that he trusted God. And that's the way we ought to live. We came into this world with nothing. And we have no claim on anything to take with us when we leave. In Ecclesiastes 5.15. And he came forth of his mother's womb. Naked shall he return to go as he came. And shall, not, and shall take nothing of his labor which he may carry away in his hand. In Matthew 6.25. Therefore I say unto you. Take no thought for your life what ye shall eat and what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on. Is not life more than meat or food and body more than, than clothing? Some people worship clothing. We have, we have a, a group of people, athletes in the world, who, who worship sneakers. They have hundreds of, they got tens of thousands of dollars in sneakers. They're not going to take one of them. They're not going to take a shoelace with them. We know that Paul's exper experienced times when he had very little. We know that from his word in Acts. It is not unlikely that he slept out under the stars at times and may have had, had just a morsel of food to drink and eat to sustain him. Paul may be preparing Timothy for such times as he may come upon him personally and also the people he ministered to. God's word God's word shows the warts as well as, well as, as the blessings. He doesn't hide anything from us. He tells us the Christian life can be a very difficult life. Paul was the apostle, stopped by the Lord on the road to Damascus, and there its conversion occurred, and he became God's chosen messenger to Gentile people. 
he totally changed his life. And he went from having just about anything he wanted to having nothing of this world. And Paul is preparing Timothy for, for that. This is not going to be an easy task I'm sending you to. I'm not hiding anything from you. This, when you go to Ephesus, you're going to run into all kinds of issues. You may have very little to sustain you physically or monetarily. He's preparing them for all this. And God prepares us through, through his word. He tells us that difficult times where come. And he tells us how to get through them. He doesn't, he doesn't say, I'm going to cure all your ills or pay all your bills. He doesn't say that. We know that Paul's life experience, you know, we need to remember that becoming a Christian uh, may have resulted in the person losing both job and family. That was true for the early Jews. When the early Jews converted to Christianity, their family put them out even today in Israel. You have a, a, a person over there that's maybe a Jew that's been witnessed to about the Lord Jesus Christ as being the Savior and in him sin and sin alone is forgiven. They know that if they trust Christ as their Savior, their family will put them out and they may lose their job. Verse 8, and having food and raiment, let us be there with content. If you've got something to eat and you've got clothes to wear, Paul is telling Timothy, you, you may have to be content with just that. Remember, Timothy, you know, well, uh, we'll get to it. Hebrews 13. So verse 8, Hebrews 13, 5, let your conversation or your lifestyle be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he had said, I will never leave thee or forsake thee. When you have Christ, you have everything. If you're a born again child of God, having trusted Christ as your personal Savior, believing in his finished work on the cross of Calvary, nothing added, nothing taken away, Christ and Christ alone. That he died, he bore our sins in his body, he, he died, he shed his precious blood to pay the full price of our sin debt, was buried, and on the third day he arose bodily from the grave and he sits at the Father's right hand. There's a man in heaven, the God-man, Christ Jesus the Lord. And we as born-again believers are joint heirs with Christ. We're told that. What more could you want? Now, we, we know so little about it, what, what goes, what's going to be ahead of us in heaven, but we know a number of things. No more pain, no more sorrow, no more disease, no more sin. But what are we going to be doing? Are we going to be playing golf or driving motor cars? Probably none of that. All that's earthly stuff. But it, it will be fantastic. And so we look forward to the Lord's soon return. There are parts of the world where this is all that many people have, and when they have it, they're grateful. There are people that literally have nothing but a little food and the clothes on their back. I mean, we don't hear about so much of it. We almost get no news from Africa in this country. <laughs> all those countries there, and from uh, the Far East. India. India has the world's, what, second greatest population next to China. And, uh, I mean, they, they're a huge country, people-wise. And they still have a caste system over there, even though they would deny it. It still, it still exists. So there are people that are born into poverty, who, into poverty who never, ever have an opportunity to get out of it. And they just live in it. They clean toilets. They sweep streets. They pick up garbage. That's what they do. They're born into that. And yet they go, th they go through their life, you know, that's what the, that's all that that's provided for them. Uh, what is going on, you know, and so uh, what is going on at the southern border here I have mentioned is disgraceful, but we notice that many of those people are, are, are carrying our, on their backs. You know, it, it, it's a mixed it's a mixed kind of thing. You can see these people coming and we know that there are cartel people and and. and and uh, Islamists, uh, killers and drug dealers and all that. But there are other people who are trying to find a, a better life. And they got a backpack on. And that's the only thing they have is the backpack, which may be some, a change or two of clothes, maybe a bottle of water or something. That's all they have. And so it is a, hum it is a humanitarian crisis 
It's mo way more than that. But it is. These people are, are seeking, coming to a country where the government says, that, you know, we're going to take care of you. I mean, I would go. I would go. So, but, but we've, we've, it should be done in a regulated manner, and, and we've, not, we've let evil in, in these cartels and the drugs. That's the pro real problem. And so, where was I? They want, they, want, they want more, and they're coming into our country to get it. You know, they want more than what's just on their back, and they're coming here to get it. Why aren't they stopping in Mexico? Because they're not going to get it there. Mexico's a big country. And so they're coming here. In our material rich society, we never seem to be content, though. We never seem to be content. No matter what we have, we either want more or we either want something different. Uh, we call it fashion. What is fashion? That is not being content with what you have and wanting more. That's what fashion is. And the clothes, clothes they changed it. They changed the tie sizes, the fat ones, the skinny ones, the long ones, the striped ones. The, I mean, you know, they changed the shoes. Remember a point in time when you wore brown shoes with a uh, dark suit? People would stare at you and laugh. Now if you don't do that, you're out of touch with, I mean, it's all. It's, a, it's appealing to our lack of contentment in what we have. We are so far removed from what is really necessary in material things. We haven't a clue. And we live in, as Christians, we are, you know, we are, we need to be prepared. We may, as true Christians, we may lose everything. They're, we're going to lose our freedoms here pretty soon. You can see it's happening. We're not going to be able to have this meeting here legally in, the, in the, some days to come. And so, as Christians, we are prepared to lose it all, or we should be, and maintain a good testimony for the Lord Jesus Christ. We, will we be able to say and do as, and do as Job said? Did I, I'm, I hope I would be able to do that. The Lord gave, the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. Oh, my. That's the standard. Verse 9, but they that be, be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. Key words here are will be. The will be here. But they that, they that will be rich, will be rich, okay? It's the will be here that often is the problem. This is the intent of the heart and the mind. That's, what the, that's where the will is. That's where the will be is. They will be rich in material things, but with the possession of material things often comes the desire for authority and power. So the money doesn't satisfy. There's never enough. This lustful desire leads to many prob problematic uh, areas of life. It's the will be. They will be rich. Temptation, adversity, Proverbs 28, 20, a faithful man shall abound with blessings, but he that maketh haste to be rich shall not be innocent. People want to get rich quick. And so we put the lottery into, into place in this nation to help our kids in education, right? What a lie. That's, that was what they said. This is going to help pay for all the education. And the more stuff we give the kids in the classrooms, the dumber they get. We are a stupid nation now. We're, what, 26th in the world in, in literacy? We're dumbing down our kids, not, not teaching them. This, uh, so this lustful, it leads, this lustful desire leads to many problematic areas of life. It leads to temptation, adversity. Uh, and so uh, it's also a snare. It, it, it catches you in a trap. The modern day Ponzi schemes are examples of compounding evil. Many foolish and lustful hurts. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 22. Put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, before we're saved. Uh, which is corrupt according to deceitful lusts. James 1.15, 
then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin when it is finished bringeth forth death. In Luke chapter 5, verse 7, the apostles have been laboring all night fishing and caught nothing. At the Lord's request, they cast out from the shore and dropped their nets. The catch was so great, the boats began to sink. The lesson to them was different than in our cur current verse, but the picture is a useful one. People live more live moral, emotional, and spirit that live moral, emotional, and spiritual lives can sink because of too much wealth. They were catching; they had so many fish, the boat was sinking. That was not a good catch. The Lord, Lord gave them what they wanted. They wanted lots of fish. Okay, <laughs> throw out your net, and the boat began to sink. It's, there's a double meaning there to that. It's also the fact that the Lord can provide that in a heartbeat or less. He can pro he'll provide all that we need. He, he says that, and I believe him. He's not going to lie to us. At the Lord's request, people, in verse 10, for the love of money, here's, this is a verse that's often misquoted. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. The love of money is the root of all evil. It is not the, the money that's the problem. It's not the money that's the problem. It's the love of it that is the problem. My mom did not love money. She knew how to ha handle it. She could spend it. She paid all her bills and everything. She didn't love it. She, she only needed what she needed. And so... Uh, it's not the money. Having wealth is not a sin, by the way. Having wealth is not a sin. If you have lots of money, if you own lots of stock, or you know, all this, it's, that's not a sin. We might note also that money is, is not involved in every sin. So we've got to understand what it means here. The love of money is the root of all evil. What's that mean? When Adam and Eve sinned, there was no money involved in that, right? There's no money involved in that at all. When, uh, when David uh, lusted for Bathsheba, there was no money involved in that. So it can't be that having money is, is the sin. It's the love of it. So how are we to understand the phrase? Well, the word translated all can also have the meaning of every kind if the, if the, context, if the context allows it. And I think that is the, that is the idea here. There is no evil that money at one time or another has not been the root of. You know, so uh, you think of all the evil things. We know that in, in, in sexual lust that goes on in, our, in the world, the prostitution and all that, that money is at the root of, of that. I mean, people, money's at the root of it. Alcohol, drugs, money's at the root of all of that. And then there's other things that go on. Politics. Money's at the root of, of, of a lot of that. It takes a lot of people pour money into gaining power and prestige. And so I think that's the idea when it says it's the root of all evil. There's no evil that money at one time or another doesn't get involved in as being a, really the bottom line, so to speak. So how, you know, so how, do we know if we, how do we know if we love money or not? I mean, you know, you don't have to have millions to love money. You don't even have to have hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands to love money. How do we know if we love money or not? I mean, we need to make an application for our own lives here. You know, we can't point to somebody else or, you, you, you know, you go around the park and you see this motor home and it's, you know, you know it's big, big dollars and you see another, you know, it's smaller dollars, you know. You can't tell. If, 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 you know, maybe that's just, you know, that's fine. It's just fine. There's nothing wrong with that. There's no sin in that. Well, so how do we know if we love money or not? I think when does, when does possession of money or the lack thereof be, be, become a lusting love for it? Philippians 4.11, not that I speak of respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am there to be content. That's, again, that is Paul's position who had little or nothing in the way of material possessions, except what, the clothes on his back. No place to live, no longer had a home, no longer had any material he, he, food and stuff. Sometimes he went hungry. 
sometimes not. He says, which, uh, continuing in verse 10, which while some coveted after they have erred from the faith. So we're talking about people in the church here. Remember, this is not the lost on the next door neighbor or those uh, you know, heathen over in some country somewhere. This is talking about people in the church. So how? So now we are talking about people in the church who have coveted after money. Colossians three five says that covetous this idolatry. They worship it. It's on their mind all the time. They spend their days trying to gain more of it. Ephesians five three says that the covetous that should not be named once among Christians as becometh saints, save people. The word erred is a planeo, meaning to stray. Back in, in 1 Timothy 4, 1, we have mentioned those who were apostate. That is, they knew the truth, but deliberately turned that from a, I don't think these people are necessarily apostate. But they, they, they have a love for money in the, in the church. And so the, if those of you seem to be engaged in monetary pursuits that will lead them into ungodly practices. That's easy to do. There are times when some trust in the Lord and, and find themselves employed in such as to be inconsistent with the word of God. I had that problem after I got saved. I had a very good job before I got saved. And I had that very good job after I got saved. And I had to change my thinking about how I did my job. And because, uh, you know, there were certain things that God pointed out to me that I shouldn't, be, shouldn't have been doing. And so, and then, you know, you reach a point, some, at one point in time, uh, when I told the Lord when we lived in Colorado Springs that well, I just want to go work for you. <laughs> I, I was making a very good living there. And I, you know, five minutes from work, I mean, close, good people, loved them. Uh, they no nice office, big chair. I told the Lord I want to go work for him, so I'm going to quit. I talked to Marge, can we make it? I said, we, yeah, we can make it. We, we purposed in our heart when we moved there not to have a mortgage, so we, we bought down to what we could afford. And so what did the Lord do? He closed down the, the, the division that I was working for, and they gave me a pension. I didn't have to quit. He gave me right then and there. I mean, I did, he gave me a pen. I mean, it was like within weeks after I made that decision. And so, they've been paying me ever since. Twenty years. Twenty years. But the, that's how the Lord works in your life. But you got to step out in faith first. The Jews always wanted a sign. Show me first, Lord. Then I'll believe. And He showed them, and they still didn't believe. For the Christian, look at Job. What a, he's there, he's got sores, and he's sick, and he's, people are avoiding him, and he's got no family, they're dead, his servants are gone. It's, and he's sitting there, and he's still praising God and worshiping, knowing God does all things well. He's waiting for God to do something. His wife told him, why don't you curse God and go home? <laughs> he wasn't, he wasn't going to do that. So we got we got this money thing here, we, you know. It's been, this stuff, all this stuff we have is is a curse. We got to maintain it. We got to wipe it down. We got to wash it. We got to fix it. We got to move it around and dust it. I hate it. Okay, so it seems you know. So uh, let's see, where was I? That does not seem to be the case here. Those in view here seem to be engaged in monetary pursuits that will lead them to ungodly practices. There are, time, there are times when some trust, uh, some trust in the Lord and find themselves employed as to be inconsistent with the word of God. And I found that myself a little bit. They make a good wage and Satan will do his best to convince them that it's okay to remain employed in such an endeavor. We had a fellow back in Virginia uh, who was in the church. I, don't, I believe he was saved, but I couldn't tell. He ran a liquor store. He couldn't get out of the liquor store. He wouldn't give up the liquor store. Yeah, he couldn't serve in the church. He would go, probably paid, paid his tithes, and maybe not, and he just died. Uh, I saw that. Anyway, he should have come out. God would have taken care of him if he had stepped. God would. He was afraid of losing his his income. God would have taken care of him. 
We've got to believe that. You've got to step out in faith. They make a good way. The right thing to do is engage the Lord in prayer and then abandon such a plan. You pray to the Lord about it. Lord, I'm, go I'm going to give this thing up. I prayed about leaving. And God just took care of it for me. I didn't have to do anything. It was a surprise to me. And I, you know, and I, but I knew where it came from. He also rolled me over in a RV in my truck on a country road in the middle of the night because I didn't finish a job. I, so, you know, he knows how to get your attention in, in, in multiple ways. They pierce themselves through with many sorrows, the consequence of coveting money. It's, it's a metaphor as the piercing of the body causes physical damage. So covetousness damages our spiritual life as well. Also, uh, the, the 20, the, 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 this last year's Bitcoin fiasco. Remember the debacle where people... But, you know, and we blame the guy who set the company up and he's the one that they're going to try and get to prison. But, you know, he would not have had any success at all if people didn't want to get ri rich quick. And they saw a way to get rich quick. And the Lord says, not today. And they lost it all. The lottery is like that. It's been, and there's some people can afford the tickets. There are some people that are giving up the kids' meals and the kids' clothing and stuff trying to win the lottery. Gambling, and it's a disease. One of the few vices I didn't do. <laughs> you know, in some way or another, even in your head, you know, the sin in your mind is it's, it's still sin, even if you don't physically do it, if you think about it. It's self-inflicted. These are self-inflicted wounds, when uh, spiritual wounds, when we do these things. Today's pro athletes provide great examples. If you look at, if you follow some of these pro athletes, I mean, they make hundreds of millions of dollars. And then you read about some of them that have done, made those. They're bankrupt. It's a, you know, and so. The, the the Bitcoin crashed and burned. Some, maybe most, those that, that win big money in the lotteries can relate. They, they often come back with sorrowful things. They won these lotteries and they get this money and they find out that they've had nothing but, but people after them and trying to take it away from them. They're fighting to keep it and they can't trust their accountant and they can't trust their their stockbroker and they can't trust anybody and they invest in bad things and they lose the money. Many of them come back and say, I wish I never, wish I never won it. Verse 11. You've got a few minutes. But thou, O man of God, flee these things. So he's warning Timothy. He's, Timothy is going to this church at Ephesus. It's a, it's a church that Paul already has established. But there's issues in the church. There's issues in every church. And, and P Timothy is going there to set some things straight. And he's going to have opposition to it. And he's a young man. He's a, he's a younger person. He's not, not a child. He's not a teenager. I don't think he's even in his low 20s. He's probably somewhere in the 30 area between 29 and 39 and somewhere in there maybe. A young man. And he's going to have opposition. He's going to have older people he has to deal with. And he needs to deal with them reverently. And so... He tells, and he's going to be enticed. There's going to be God, Satan is going to be busy there trying to get Timothy to engage in some of these ungodly practices. The local church came to hold great influence among the people. And there quickly appeared on the scene those with secular powers who desired ecclesiastical support as well for their benefit. They wanted to be the part of the church. The ungodly union peaked when Constantine did exactly that the Emperor Constantine. He did not Christianize the world. He paganized the church is what he did. He brought more pagan things into the church. He didn't make the, church, the, world, the Roman world Christian. He made the Christian world there pagans. He called, he called in the early days, he called all the, the church councils and he superintended over them and he ran them. And he gave him the things to talk about. And he killed his wife. And he killed his own son. And he, he, and he worshipped idols. We look at Constantine. Oh, he's the one that made the church. Formed the church. He's the one that destroyed it. He 
he, he, he contaminated it with paganism. And it's there today, and it's getting more. We do yoga, right? That's, that's Hindu religion. Stay away from it. And uh, I'm going to stop there. I stop at 11 o'clock, and, <laughs> and it's 11 o'clock. So, and today, uh, t today's the 22nd or the 23rd? 22nd. Whoa, two, 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 three. There we go. Anyway, well, hopefully. Well, let's, uh, let's close in a word of prayer, and then I can turn off the mic. Father, thank you again for this time we've had in your word this morning, and we thank you, Lord, for the gathering together here today that we can do this still without fear of persecution. There's a message here in your word. Your word has the power, not mine. I pray that I'd said nothing that would distract from your inerrant word. I pray that you'd finish your word in our hearts this morning and uh, take us from here uh, safely. Give us a good day. Thank you for the beautiful weather you've provided, and thank you for the great love you commended towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And we thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.